Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. If you're watching this video and you haven't watched my previous video, then uh, please stop and go and watch the other one first. This video is a continuation of my discussion on pyro storms, megafires and fire nados, or basically fire triggered thunderstorms known technically as pyrocumulonimbus clouds or pyro CBs. These fires generate tornado-like winds, can cast flaming embers for five kilometers radius out from where the fire is. They have a volcanic level of energy and they can loft materials up into the stratosphere where they have global changes. They, they can, affect, can affect weather and climate globally because they're up in the stratosphere and um, material lofted up into the lower stratosphere from the BC British Columbia fires in 2017 stayed up there for eight months and were recorded to descend in the Arctic over Greenland um, and also over the over the uh, Canadian Arctic islands. Okay, so um, let me continue off where I left off from the previous video. So I was talking about this article, Pyro Storms, a New Danger in the Era, era of Wildfires. And I was down, I was talking about the, so the, normally these cumulonimbus clouds produce a lot of precipitation. That's where the nimbus comes from. That's what the nimbus means. It means uh, rain cloud. But the heat and particulates in the smoke, when you have them fire triggered, um, it can arrest the ability of the cloud to produce precipitation. So what you get left is a lightning storm that moves across the surrounding landscape, triggering more fires. So this happened in the Fort McFerry, McMurray fires in 2016. There was lightning triggered, lightning uh, ignited fires about 22 miles away from the original pyrocumulonimbus uh, cloud. Now, in uh, late 2018, there was an entire session of the American Geophysical Union meeting in Washington devoted to the subject of pyro CBs and how they can affect weather and climate in the same way that volcanic eruptions have in the past. Okay, um, it turns out that the smoke and aerosols from the wildfires can rise high into the stratosphere, the upper atmosphere where there's no longer weather, stuff is no longer rained out. So it's similar although on a much smaller scale to volcanic eruptions. All right, so um, basically, uh, you know, one of the papers showed that smoke and black carbon from the August 2017 fires in British Columbia and Washington may have lingered for eight months up in the stratosphere because there's no rain to get washed out. What goes up must eventually come down, and it did in high Arctic monitoring stations on Ellesmere Island. They detected suddenly high levels of ammonia, carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, and ethane that were consistent with what this fire, the BC and Washington fires in 2017, ejected into the stratosphere. Um, also, you know, they then looked back at the data in previous years, there were massive fires in Russia during the heat waves that destroyed 40% of the Russian grain crop, uh, but things are, were worse in 2017. Okay, um, so satellites uh, occasionally detect strange looking clouds in the stratosphere in summer. Strange because clouds like this usually form only in the winter. Um, so they basically concluded, well, at the time they concluded that they came from volcanic eruptions, but there were no volcanoes at the time. So going back and doing detective work, it turns out that they were due to fires. So there was this summer of 20, 2001, there were extreme pulses of smoke from the Chisholm fire in Alberta. It was one of the hottest fires on record, and it actually put these, um, clouds of ash and dust into the stratosphere, which then drifted around the world more than once. Okay, um, they actually then flew planes into some of these um, pyrocumulonimbus clouds, and uh, they were in total darkness. Okay, the abundance of smoke and small cloud droplets made them, uh, you know, total darkness inside these, inside these clouds. Um, they could smell s smoke from the forest fires, 
Okay, and uh, the problem is, is that these fires are increasing dramatically. They're producing more energy, they're erupting in places where they've never been seen before. Okay, um, since the turn of the century, an average of 73,200 wildfires have burned roughly 6.9 million acres in the U.S. each year. This is nearly double the 3.3 million acres. Well, it is double the 3.3 is 6.6. .6. So this is nearly double. This is over double what was burned annually in the 1990s. Okay, uh, there's an average of 25 single, single pyro CB events a year in Western North America now. Okay, so we're getting more and more of these events. And um, yeah, okay. So let's have a look on, so Kamloops, BC is where these fires were erupting. So let's, if we've got Vancouver Island, Let's go down a little bit and come straight across. This is Kamloops, BC, as seen on Google Earth. So now we go into Earth Null School. Vancouver Island, come across. I think it's this little patch here. So I set the date to August 12th, 2017. And we're looking at the chemical properties. We're looking at carbon monoxide. Okay, and I can go back a day and we can so, so kind of look at this area here and see see what's developing there okay so i'm going back in time okay so it looks like there's a there, there's uh there we go okay so something okay so basically not much is happening here um towards the end of july and then these fires are igniting all over and they're producing the carbon monoxide which you can see on earth null school if you just google earth null school click on earth click on chemistry um, go into the url up here and physically change the date you know so i changed that it from present <coughs> excuse me from present to 2017 you know august right and now we're looking through and you can see where the fires are based on the carbon monoxide that's being produced um, let's go back to the fifth or the 12th, rather, August 12th. Um, okay. And uh, so this is the CO. We can look at the CO2. We can look at the sulfur dioxide. Okay, we can look at the particulates. So PM1, particles less than... 1 micron, PM 2.5, PM 10, okay, and you can see how the fire, you can see how the fire, I'm changing three hour increments now. Okay, so I can change to the time of day that's maximized and then switch back to um, switch back a day. Okay, so this is PM10, PM2.5, PM1, right? So SO4, and then again, the chemistry, the carbon monoxide. It really, the carbon monoxide really shows up very clearly. And then the other gases. Okay, so you can see, you can, you can see these fires, how they progress and stuff, get lots of information yourself just by Googling Earth null school now people in canada in, in in the west are getting really fed up from these fires they were last summer so basically air purification sales have surged as canadians anticipate smoky summer stuck indoors so this is prince george it was dark orange this is daytime sky over bc as fires were nearby in bc in 2018 um so people are basically trying to make a clean room in their house where they have air filters, air purifiers. So when the smoke gets in, they can't stop it getting into their whole house, but they can stop it getting into a room. The smoke was so bad it, that, that uh, Prince George was one of the 10 most polluted cities in the world in August 2018. Okay, uh, this is uh, some tweets here. So this is uh, 10 plus is high, very high risk. 
This is low risk. This is August 2018. And you can see all of these days that pegged out at the maximum. And this is, uh, you know, in Prince George. Okay, so this really has a negative impact on people's health. You know, this is what it looked out, like outside during the middle of the day. Um, this guy is in the shopping mall has added um, thousands of bucks to buy carbon filters to put on the mall's 130 rooftop HVAC units, industrial air scrubbers, so people can at least go to the mall, you know, if there's massive fires again and the massive smoke and, the, you know, air pollution like, like uh, you know, off the charts in the city for multiple days at a time, people can go and camp out at the mall and uh, have clean air. Okay, um, now let's look at just a, a sampling of some of the papers that were talked about at the AGU conference on these pyrocumulonimbus um, fires, fire clouds. So long-range transported Canadian smoke plumes in the lower stratosphere that were measured over northern France. So let's just have, I won't go into all of the details in these papers because I've got a number I want to look at but let's just have a look at some of the... Okay, so it shows the plumes. It uses laser radars to detect the plumes. Here we go. So here's... This is a region where all the fires were occurring in August from MODIS. And these fires were, were then... Um, the, the progression of these they over to Europe was as such. Okay, and uh, these locations... Um, the, the tracks, uh, you know, there were samplings done and, uh, you know, these plumes definitely crossed and uh, affected the air over Europe from that paper. Wildfires um, and weather radar, okay, we have loads of radars for weather and on these red weather radars, you can, you know, we have weather radar, we have airborne platforms, satellites, geostationary satellites, we've got the fire event and you can see the plume developing from the fire and traveling and where it goes to um, and the intensities of the radar scatter shown here. Um, the Australians, of course, are doing loads of stuff on um, wildfires because they, they had all these people killed and they've sort of classified some different, different types of fires so, and different events. So spotting is a behavior where fire produces firebrands or embers that can be carried by the wind. So these are, you know, if, the, um, if they're fairly large burning pieces, um, they can be carried high up into the atmosphere and then dropped beyond the zones of the main fire, triggering other fires. Fire tornadoes, spinning vortices, range in size from less than a foot to over 500 feet in diameter. Large fire whirls have the intensity of a small tornado. Okay, picked up the fire hose. There's fire channeling, jump fires, eruptive fires, crown fires, conflagrations, downbursts. Okay, there's all of these things, uh, pyroconvective events. Now in Australia, they called it a flammogenitus cloud, as a, but now they're starting to, that's the same thing. It's a pyrocumulonimbus cloud. So, so this study, uh, determining the threshold conditions for extreme fire behavior. You can find that. Um, some uh, older fires are being studied now, now that we know what's going on to a better extent. Um, it, it, here's some Soviet, uh, some Russia studies of these pyrocumulus events. And uh, what they do is they're looking, okay, so here's the pyrocumulus plume, and then this is where it ends up being measured here. So they have all these different trajectories from these different fires, showing the, where the fire is forming and how it's being measured at their, at their different uh, location in Tomsk, I guess. Okay, so all kinds of data from the Soviet Union, um, different mo Portugal fires, you know, modeling done, um, br the British Columbia uh, fires, a NASA study showing the plumes coming up and how they travel and how high they get. Um, Basically, a paper talking about uh, the injection, how much of the materials from these, fi these fire-triggered clouds can get ejected into the stratosphere. Um, you know, here's some... So they look. this is looking at... Here's an actual eruption, and these are different fires. Um, that This is the 2017 fires in B.C. and Washington, so it gives you an idea of the amount of mass that's injected into the that goes up into the stratosphere from, from these fires. 
So lots of uh, neat stuff. Thanks for listening.